application. I have been a trainer to law enforcement for over 20 years. My talks would usually begin with new times breed new crimes and to handle these we need to develop new crime fighting paradigms. In the second half of the 1990s, mobile phones were introduced in India. And the criminals, they adopted this technology really quickly. They integrated with it and they began to use it in their operations. I began building awareness with law enforcement about mobile phones and how they could be used in investigations to you know, catch the bad guys. I would normally lead with the question. How many of you have a mobile phone? And this is the kind of answer I would get. Just one or two would say, yes, I have a mobile phone. And, you know, if you don't have a mobile phone, how can you investigate it? It takes time for you to understand how the technology works. However, as time elapsed, Everybody began to get a mobile phone. So when I would ask the same question down the line, I would get a response which was like this. I realized I had to change my question. And I began to ask, how many of you do not have a mobile phone? And this was again the response I began to get. One or two would say, I don't have a mobile phone. So the question arose. Why don't you have a mobile phone? And they would say, mobile phones are a nuisance. They are a trouble. They will constantly, you know, catch you when you don't want to be caught. In fact, I have a terror at home. I have a terror in the office. They, you know, they will keep me tracked all the time. They will call me day and night. I don't want a mobile phone. I'm not getting one. I know those people even now. They all have a mobile phone. And in all probability, it is those very terrors, their wives and their bosses, who have enforced that they have a mobile phone. Which brings me to the point, mobile phones are everywhere. In fact, they are really everywhere. From an investigation perspective, in most crimes, mobile phones are present with the victim, with the perpetrator, and with also all the eyewitnesses who are present there at the scene of the crime. And as an investigator, it is our job to make mobile phones talk. Right? So, finding criminals or their mobile phones is, you know, the equivalent of the proverbial situation of hunting for a needle in a haystack. And in the Indian context, it's like hunting for a needle in a billion haystacks. It is incredibly complex and it is overlaid with a thousand different variations and subtleties. And this is for all of you computer geeks out there. This is a typical big data problem. Which brings me to the first of the technologies I want to talk to you about in this fight against crime, big data analytics. We are a nation of 1.3 billion people, 900 million cell phones. In fact, the cost of a call is less than a hundredth of a cent per second. And in some cases now, it is totally free. There are 15 mobile service providers. And each of these has multiple cell towers in every location. The sheer volume of data generated by these, you know, text messages, telephone calls, internet activity, is huge. It's mind-boggling. Analyzing these billions of pieces of communication to narrow it down to that one communication that helps us nail the bad guy is a problem 
that has been perpetually very difficult for law enforcement to solve. But the same data mining problem causes any data scientist, you know, who's worth his salt, it causes that person to drool. Yes, I can do this. The myriad ways in which this technology is helping slice, dice, and manage all sorts of, you know, structured and unstructured data is helping police forces getting new insights into solving crimes. These new techniques help place a criminal at the scene of the crime and the time of the crime. helps us identify the associates of the criminal and it also helps us identify the kind of behavior the criminal has. I wanted to share a small story. <coughs> a few years ago, the only son of a rich businessman was kidnapped from in front of his school. There were a number of eyewitnesses. His schoolmates saw the kidnapping happening and they described the kidnapper. They described the vehicle. Unfortunately, nobody had any insights into the number or the registration plate of the vehicle. A huge manhunt was launched and nothing was found. The waiting game began. The parents of the child and the police were all waiting for a call demanding ransom. The call never came. After three tense days, the father, I've got, you know, I can't stand this tense atmosphere anymore. I must go get a change of scene. So he goes to his office and you know he logs in into his computer to check his mail. And the very first mail that he gets is from the kidnapper. And the mail says, I want 15 million bucks as a ransom. Now, the IP address of this email is traced. It ends up in a cyber cafe. The cyber cafe owner is quizzed. And the cyber cafe owner gives a description of this guy. The description matches what the children over there described as the kidnapper. The law of diminishing recovery plays a very big role in kidnapping incidents. The longer the period of time that has elapsed since the kidnapping, the lesser the chances of getting the victim back alive. Three days had already passed. Time was running out. The father of the child was advised, send back an email, say that you will pay the money. Just ask for proof that the child is alive. That's exactly what he did. Another day elapsed. Another email was received. And attached to the email was a short video of the child. Crying, but alive though unhappy. However, on closer examination of the video, the video you know, had some discrepancies. It gave off an odd feeling and when it was closely examined, it was found that just before the video began, there was a very low sound which was recorded and in that it was, the words were, start crying. So, you know, that sort of raised the antenna and when the video was examined, it was found that the child was not bound, not tied down and nor was the child blindfolded. Alarm bells started ringing because it became obvious that the child knew the kidnapper and the kidnapper knew the child. <coughs> All the indications are that when this happens, the probability of the child coming out of this alive is very low because the kidnapper now has to kill the child because the child can identify the kidnapper. At this point, speed was of the essence and the police swung into action. A cell site analyzer was taken to each of the contact points. One was the scene of the kidnapping and the other two were the cyber cafes that were in the question. Cellular tower IDs of all the cell towers covering each of these 
locations was identified. There were as many as 37 in one location and 42 in the other two. And as I had mentioned earlier, these were from different service providers. Law enforcement sent in an emergency request to all the service providers. They said, please send us a detailed log of all the cellular activity in these specific towers. Which means messages, telephone calls, internet activity. Huge volumes of data can be a daunting task. And with the clock ticking, it can be terrifying. Something had to be done and done very, very quickly. We had to think out of the box. It is surprising the things you can think of when the heat is on. The data was grouped into three sets. One for each of the locations where CDAMs, call data analysis and management system. Filters based on the approximate date and time were applied. Set theory was run on these huge volumes and common numbers present at the scene of the crime as well as the cyber cafe locations were identified. Each of these common numbers were investigated and in short order, a man matching the description was found. A combination of surveillance and standard policing techniques were used and the child was recovered and the kidnapper was nabbed. The next technology I want to talk about is drones. Ever since man learned to fly, our fascination with getting high seems to have no limits. Drones are a major force multiplier for law enforcement. Let me share an incident. In a certain city, communal tensions ran high. A religious procession of a particular community was expected to pass through the city and one of the streets that it was supposed to pass through was through another community's dominated neighborhood. Stone pelting was expected, followed by armed clashes. However, uh, nobody wanted this to happen. So the police forces sent out a drone and when it surveilled the area which was belonged to the other community, it was found that the terraces had stacks of stones placed on them for just this eventuality. This immediately, you know, triggered off alarm bells in various quarters and the procession was rerouted and a major incident was averted. So drones are eyes in the sky. The flying delivery boys, lethal killers, life savers, you name it. They can get to places we can't deliver stuff. And all the while, they can document everything that they're doing. The skyway is the new highway. This brings a whole new dimension to policing and it's just another way that technology is pushing the policing angle. The third technology I wanted to discuss was artificial intelligence and machine learning. A news article that I had recently read pointed out that the United Kingdom has 1% of the whole world's population and 20% of the whole world's CCTVs. Which brings us to a ratio that in the UK, there are 11 cameras to every person. Think about it. And that kind of surveillance produces huge amounts of data. And it is physically not possible to go through such large portions of video feed to identify the bad guy. This is where machine learning and artificial intelligence come to the rescue. Today, ANPR or Automatic Number Plate Recognition Systems, Crime uh, Face Matching Systems, Voice Recognition, Hotspot, Heat Mapping and Vehicle Identification Systems all benefit from the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning. A root cause analysis of a robbery prone neighborhood was done and it was overlaid with a GIS system. and a fantastic conclusion came out. We found 
and now you know with hindsight it seems obvious that most of the robberies happened in areas that were poorly lit. In a recent hit and run case, the rear portion of a vehicle was caught on one of the roadside cameras and that had this logo of a leaping feline, the Jaguar logo. Immediately, you know, a hunt was launched for all the Jaguars that had been in that area. However, a 10 second with the visual vehicle identification system using artificial learning system, immediately identified the car as a Hyundai Verna, which had been just decked up to make it more upmarket. With CCTVs on every corner, the value of video evidence is on the up and up. However, these videos suffer from issues of low resolution, poor lighting, and bad fixation angles. Technology today allows us to enhance videos and sort out these kind of issues. So, you can run, but you can't hide. With all the data and enhanced processing capabilities that are coming into the hands of law enforcement, predictive policing using artificial intelligence is slowly becoming a reality. And for all those of you who are looking for something exciting to work with or something interesting to pivot to, I have an idea. Join us on this meaningful quest to build solutions for a safer planet. That is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.